All right, good evening, guys. I got David here from Illusion Production. David, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. How are you doing today? Doing all right, man. I appreciate you coming on. Um, I got a question. What got you started on this? Because this is uh, some unique stuff you got here. I love conspiracy theories. I love throwing out stuff like that. Your TikTok was intriguing. Um, Thank you. What got you started? Two. Uh, well, the, a lot of things, man. The uh, I guess what kind of first got me started on this kind of journey of making these kind of videos was uh, Donald Trump's presidency back in 2016. That was the first uh, thing because that was the first time I realized I couldn't really trust the media. I couldn't trust everything that I heard uh, on the news or on the internet. Uh, and as the years went by, it just became a little bit more and more obvious the uh, propaganda that's being spread in literally every country you go to. It really doesn't matter. There's propaganda of all sorts and all types. So, and it was really concerning to me because I was taught that when I was growing up that we're a free and open society and that freedom of press is a very important thing and to tell the truth as news is a very important thing. And when you manipulate and you create narratives and lies, they have such drastic effects. So I eventually saw other YouTube channels, notably uh, there's a channel called Moon, there's a channel called Jake Tran, uh, and they kind of opened my eyes to the fact that we don't have to depend on companies like CNN or Fox News or things like that to tell us the news. People independently can go out and they can do their own research and they can really figure out what's going on. We don't need to rely on uh, a group of people to tell us what's going on. We can work together to figure things out ourselves. And uh, as I started making the videos, it was kind of interesting because slowly I was starting to build a community of people who had the same kind of concerns that I had of being lied to, not being able to figure out what's really going on and looking for other people who were having the same issues. Uh, and then you throw on the censorship on top of that, it's just gotten uh, crazy. It's uh, So I believe it's now is the time to tell the truth uh, even more. We, we can't, uh, you have to stand on what you believe at some point, you know? Yeah, I agree with you. I'll be honest with you. I think we were designed to be told the truth. Yeah. I don't know if it's like a, a compass. I don't know what it is that makes us want to hear the truth, no matter how harsh it may be. And mm -hmm. I, I agree with you on social media. Social media is great, man. The other day I was on TikTok and I'm just scrolling through, just looking around. And there is someone being an, invest an investigative journalist, man. There's like 20 <laughs> cops outside and she's out there. Given the play by play with everything she could hear and see, man. And I would never know that was happening in North Carolina right there in that moment unless she would have had that live on TikTok. It's crazy because now we truly have eyes on, uh, on everything. On everything. And like, it's like, yeah, the government has that already. Intelligence agencies already have the eyes on everybody already. But we have that same power too if we work together. Well, I, I think we were we're more closely connected than we believe, than we realize. We're all interconnected way more than we realize. Oh, I 100% agree with that. And especially with like uh, people of we have like translations now. Like you could just type in Google Translate somebody in a different country, and you can have not a great conversation, but you can basically get your points across to somebody who speaks a different language. Back in the day, that, that was unheard of. Without that third person, it was a non-starter. It was a non-starter. Now you can literally communicate with just about anybody. Which in and of itself is amazing. And I'll be yeah. honest with you, with the, the way AI is going and stuff, I think everything's going to change quick. Um, Have you... I'm uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, man. Oh, uh, I was just going to ask you about ChatGPT since you brought up AI. That's what I've got on my paper right here, man. Oh, right, I was right. just going to bring that up, man. Okay, so um, have you used it yet? Yes. Okay. What'd you think? Okay. Um, I think genuinely I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about it. I'm genuinely nervous about it 
because it's kind of insane. It's genuinely insane what you can you can ask it to do and it can do and like that. Like oh, to give you an instant. example. It's instant. Yeah, it's instant. It's crazy. Jordan Peterson made a great video and he was explaining how uh, he asked it specifically. It was a uh, he wanted it to be like a college level essay on like some war or something like in the 1800s. Uh, and he gave it pr specific parameters. I can't remember exactly. Expressed but, as if, uh, like, uh, what's his name wrote it? Like, uh, uh William Shakespeare wrote it with, guess, uh, with the, with the viewpoint of like a Taoist or something. Exactly. And, and he got he, six of them instantly, instantly in five seconds. He said that he couldn't tell the difference if he like, if somebody of his level wrote the paper or not. Yeah. And it did it in five seconds. So like hearing that you can, if you know how to use the parameters, it's insane what you can really ask it to do. And it's scary because of the jobs that I, genuinely. I already have a great way to explain it to everybody. Cause God, I already did this God. with my, I did this with my 14 year old. She made uh, like $18 writing two essays for friends. And I was like, yeah. you know, you don't have to write them. You know that, right? I was like, you come over here on the computer and you type in and uh, chat GBT that you want to write this essay. And it'll just spit it right off. And she's like, well, I need uh something context or something. Uh, it had to be sort of, I was like, no, 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 it'll do it. She tries it. She's like, dad, it worked. So she's going to go out there and see if she can make $10 of paper. Cause no one at school knows about it yet. And it's she's crazy. literally going to make money off of chat GPT. Hopefully yeah. next week. Hopefully next week. One thing though, to, I do want to point out about chat GBT. I was talking with a, a network security specialist yesterday and or no, I'm sorry, network administrator yesterday. And I asked him a little bit about chat GBT and one kind of saving grace about it is because I asked him, I was like, look, it's going to eventually like take over everybody's jobs and everything like that. Um, and he goes, well, you got to think about it. Would you as a company, in order for it to completely take over certain jobs, it would have to have access to your passwords, access to uh, bank information, access to certain things within, like private files within your company. Do you want to give an AI access to that information? Because if you don't own the AI, whoever owns the AI is going to have access to all that private information on your company. So it's like, do you want to give something like chat GPT that level of control over your company? And well, I you feel can like layer, you can layer the, the authority and uh, say, I won't let you go past a seven without my personal permission. So something would alert you on your phone and say, this AI is about to go to level 7.5, which would be a little bit more sensitive than some of your customer's information that you'd be comfortable with. But this is the process it's going to go through and it promises not to tell anybody else. Will you say, okay. And you could say no or yes. And you can have an administrator go in and instead of having 42 administrators, you have one that occasionally actually has to work. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. And, and then that's, just, that's just answering one question. So here's the deal with chat GPT that people don't realize. So number one, if you want to ask it a question, you kind of treat it like Google. Sometimes Google doesn't spit out the right fucking answer until you ask it the right question. Sometimes you got to word the question backwards, like you're Yoda or something, but that sometimes works magically. And it's that, the same thing with chat GPT. If you want that paper correct, you got to give it the right parameters. And sometimes the parameter you put at the end should have been at the, at the beginning or vice versa or whatever it be. And when you play with it a little bit, you realize, but it's also learning. And this is where people don't realize. Now, one thing is to be able to um, compile information and think yourself through to make a sentence. Because words are thoughts. Yeah. In, in essence, they're thoughts, right? So the, yeah. the, the, the best way to create a thought that actually can grow beyond like a baby is to take those words and put them against the world. So if you could put Jet, Jet, uh, GPT inside of one of uh, Tesla's robots or one of Boston Dynamics robots and go test the theories it thinks while it's, while it's writing those things in the real world, it can actually physically learn. That's scary. Yeah. Think, think, think that through, right? So it's one thing to say E equals MC square or do any of these other math equations. But until you go and see if light actually bends by observing it, you can't prove you're right or wrong. 
So you put that AI inside the robot with GPS and the cell phone towers. It's just like a car, but instead of on wheels, it's on feet. It's got, it's got all the same cameras. You put you put the AI inside the robot, and now the robot gets a chance to test its language against the world. And why do you think they put arms and legs on it? Because they wanted to observe the world like we observe it in the parameters in which our bodies observe it. Oh, shit. Uh, Eventually, these robots will be able to do any menial task and solve the problem of fixing the nuance of why that screw wouldn't go in without me having to tell it. That would make us... What would be the point of us, the majority well, of us? Well, here, here's the deal, right? <laughs> so did we pass the test of being allowed to leave our house the last couple of years? <sighs> I'd say we failed, right? I would say we failed the test. Do we deserve to be outside? Now, if there's a robot out there mowing my lawn and a car that could deliver my food to my house and it knows exactly what I bought last week, why would I need to leave my house? The yeah. robots would be like, it'll be safer if I mow your lawn. It'll be safer if I bring you your food. It'll be safer if I drive here. It'll be safer if I make all these, these things for you happen. It'll be safer if I put the wires up. It'll be safer if I fix the cell phone tower. It'll be, fi- it'll be safer if I do everything for you. You have to stay in your house. It's just going to be like in pods, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about it, right? So what if that was reality? What if that actually came down to how it plays out, right? Fuck so that. you can't have a bunch of people in their house all the time. They go crazy. We proved yeah. that in two years, right? So yeah. what do you do? What do you do to occupy your time? Well, maybe you work in the metaverse. Maybe you get a job in the metaverse, and that's what you do for eight hours a day. Uh, they're going to try to one player, uh, that one movie, uh, play, Ready Player One. I guess, man. Okay, if that's not how that's going to play out, how would it play out, right? See, it, it, not, it makes sense too, dude, because they're also pushing the they, – they push the global uh, warming thing, the fact that, oh, in 20 years or in 10 years, 15 years, like all wildlife and all forests and everything is just going to be destroyed because we as humans are basically a cancer on the planet and we just destroy everything and we need to basically all die or a majority of us. Uh, so, like, in combination with the AI, with the fact that they're already been pushing this narrative that humanity is inherently evil and that we just destroy everything, like, we're just consumers, like, we don't actually give anything to the world, we just take, like, we're e- we're evil to Mother Nature. So, like, it all kind of, like, in a way, ties in together. It's like they're hitting us from all sides, like, in every intellectual way uh emotionally too if uh if i'm making any sense oh uh, yeah they're they're definitely uh pushing narratives uh i personally say some of the ones that they 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 per- perpetrate i call them luxury beliefs that <laughs> only a rich person can say we don't need the cops oh my gosh that was so stupid but <laughs> do you understand what i'm saying a poor person <laughs> so in, in the inner city like, do you think those women, you think those women would like the idea of not having the threat of calling the cops? What would oh their gosh. lives be like without that, at least that threat viable? And people actually, it was kind of funny too, because if a lot of people don't remember this, but if you remember, uh, you remember Chaz out in uh, Portland? Or Chaz? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That little, that little uh, autonomous uh, neighborhood. That little insurrection that yeah. lasted for like <laughs> two months. They literally... They went from all of them hated the police, but then when they actually kicked out the, well, when the mayor actually herself told the police that they couldn't go in there, then everybody that actually lived in the city were freaking out because there was nobody to call and gangs rolled in and then started extorting people for protection because that's what happens if you don't have like a centralized force to enact justice. You got to find whoever the strongest group is alive and they're going to do what they want. And it's crazy that like, we've literally already seen that and people are still like, nah, fuck the police. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's a huge mistake to. (sighs) They were saying that they were throwing parties. Like that wasn't parties. It was anarchy. Yeah. It it sounds Um, like a nightmare to me, man. I wouldn't want to live there. No, no. Absolutely not. I don't think they realize the convenience 
Um, if you're having a problem being able to call 911 and you don't have to choke to death, yeah, that's really convenient. I, I can't even begin to explain to you. If your 10-year-old or your 15-year-old daughter starts a fire in the microwave, she can call 911 yeah. and you don't have to worry about your house burning down. That's insanely convenient. Well, and now they're trying to get rid of uh... – uh, since, since you said burning your house down, it just reminded me of the fact that they're trying to get rid of uh, gas stoves too. It's like why though? That that's clean burning fuel. That's what that's what doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? None yeah, of it makes man. sense. But well, it's crazy. Oh, go ahead. You know, you you can you can pair up two thoughts. Um, you were saying they want to kill down the population. And oh, if you, they, have you seen and, the Georgia Guidestones before? Are you talking about those big monoliths there to have like how many people should be alive and don't let it get beyond that? Yeah, and then one of them and got they literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a Ten Commandments of all the nonsense that's been going on for the last two years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so if you were to uh, say you want half, well, a quarter of the population, a third of the what? It's quite a bit of people. It's it's a majority of the people going. Five hundred million people alive. That's it. Which is insane. To be um, perfect balance. With, yeah. <laughs> well, they don't. Re- Okay, that, that's a whole nother thought. Let me get back to the original thought. If you're talking about trying to lower the population and you're trying to save the environment and you're trying to do all these things, uh, getting rid of all the fertilizer and all the, the things that allow us to have modern uh, farming oh, would, yeah, would, starve, no. would starve half the population without any war. You wouldn't need any war. Half the population would die just from, uh, from starvation. Because we can produce twice as much food as we need, but if you were to make the land less fertile, you can cut the, the production in half. Have you also noticed, too, uh, who became the largest farmland owner in America uh, during COVID? I think it was uh, Bill Gates, right? Billy, well, Billy Gates. Yeah, that's not a... Billy Gates. Yeah, I don't know what What the hell doing. is he doing in there? I don't know, man. He's, <laughs> he's an odd duck, and uh, he's one of those guys that believes a lot of those luxury beliefs, man. He was also... Uh, caught with uh epstein having dinners after epstein was already convicted of because when they convicted him the first time and he was in jail for a little bit but they let him like walk out of jail but then like the second time they convicted him was when it was over but after the first time they already convicted him bill gates was literally with uh seen at dinners with jeffrey epstein oh i'm sure they had video of him on the on that island man i know dude it's all it's all it's the world's a yeah weird place man <laughs> uh yeah well uh I, i'm a i'm a big proponent that you can't lie forever the the world you know you lie you bend reality a little bit well it snaps back eventually like a ruler a plastic ruler in your face you can bend Yo. it back as much as you want it'll eventually snap you and do uh, you think that that's because of uh why do you think that is do you think that's because there's a god that judges do you think it's some spiritual force do you think it's some simulation that's the way the rules go like, why do you think that is? Well, number one, um, why do we think we're big enough or strong enough or powerful enough to bend reality? That's a good point. In, in and of itself. That, that number one, is a preposterous thought, no matter where your philosophical or uh, your <laughs> ideological thoughts go. Who are you to be strong enough to bend reality? Do, do you know what I'm saying? Because lying is literally you taking your thoughts into words and trying to manipulate the reality that's actually in front of you to be something it's not. It doesn't work that way. You can't do that. You can't say that you made a thousand pounds of grain when there's only 500 and then not expect there to be a ramification when everybody finds out. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. You, know, you can't bend reality. Reality will come back. And uh, I don't think we get away with anything, man. Um, I personally think there's a God. I personally think there's a God. Because... Um, Play it out as if there is no God. Okay. They just wouldn't... It wouldn't make sense, though, because everything comes from something. So at some point, something just had to be. And it's the chicken and egg. It's the chicken and egg. I understand that part. But um, if we don't have an aim, what is our purpose? You know what I mean? Hedonism and all this other stuff... Um, the entire goal of the lies, almost all of it, whenever whenever you look at the lies, is to make a perfect world, a utopia. Every lie ends with, we're going to make it perfect. Yeah. 
but Perfect never comes. No. And even if it did, they, I, I think there was a famous uh, a famous philosopher that said one time, I can't remember how, I think it goes something to the fact of uh, if we had the ability to just eat cake all day and swim in warm pools and propagate the, the race forever, the first thing we would do is just break everything to see some chaos. We were designed to focus on a goal. We were designed to struggle. We were designed to go on an adventure. And we were made to worship something. Yeah. Because we were made to focus and we were made to worship something. So everything's either we focus on ourselves and worship ourselves. Or we focus on something else and worship something else. Yeah, well, We have an aim. Everybody has an aim. Or an agenda. Well, the agenda is part of the aim. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to make other people aim with me. Yeah. But um, it seems to me that all the lies, whenever it's a lie, it always ends with we're going to make it perfect. And then they never get perfection. That that Aquarius, the age of Aquarius, that that perfect life, that perfect utopia, the blonde hair, blue eyed super race, whatever version of perfection that you hear, it never turns out to be perfect. It actually normally ends in utter destruction and crashing and burns epically. Yeah, it does. But it's always started with a with a promise of perfection. It's weird, dude. It's like it seems like history is like just a it's like a giant circle. Like when I was in school, I was taught that history has like it's like a line. There's there was a start, there's a beginning, like point to point, but it seems like history is we're just doing the same shit over and over and over again. Yeah. Just the system gets a little bit more complex. But it's like uh, if I go... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, man. It's just, it just seems like we... Because if I go through history, no matter what time frame I'm looking at, I can relate to people in the story uh, during any time frame because they have the same emotions and feelings as me. They made the same screw-ups and made worse screw-ups or less worse screw-ups but like i can understand the thought process behind like the screw-ups and i look today and it's like we're doing the same things that they were doing we just call it different names that's another thing i noticed too we do the same things but we just give it different names so that it looks like it's something new yeah 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 we just give it a new uh shimmer shine it's just got yeah, a new polish yeah, yeah, on it. Yeah. that's all it is because yeah. because the reality is uh, if we were created, if we are something that came from something, you know, like we were designed to be what we are, um, we're not going to change. There, there, I don't think there's any anything different from what the guys were doing in the, in the Indy Mountains or what the guys were doing in the pyramids at, at Giza or what the guys were doing over in uh, Libya with those gigantic stones. Those yeah. guys were not more or less evolved than we were. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't believe that. And, and and I'll be honest with you, I never liked ancient aliens for one reason. I love <laughs> conspiracy theories in general, and I love seeing really cool, wild stuff that don't make no sense. But I can't yeah. stand yeah. anybody telling me that a bunch of guys that want to move a rock can't move a rock. That, that was <laughs> that was rule number one for everything in ancient aliens was they moved rocks, and that's not possible. <laughs> that made me so mad every time they would do that. They would make me so mad. I don't care how big that rock is. I don't care if it took 6,000 cranes. I'm telling you now, there's always a way. And they actually found a real creative way. Those monoliths, those ones that are the real long ones with the point on top there, what are they called? Uh, shoot, every time I have this conversation, I forget what they're called. Uh, it was a crane? No, no, I'm talking about the rocks, uh, the, the Egyptian... Uh, they put a big rock up. It was long and pointy on the top. It's a... It's just... It's in the Washington, D.C. Yes. Right? That it's not an obelisk. Is it an obelisk? It is an obelisk. Yeah, Bam, an obelisk. obelisk. They, they found a gigantic obelisk, but in France, they found some paperwork, ancient paperwork, showing how they would move it. So you would hewn out this, this rock real long, and it'd be shaped like a cigar, but it'd be square. All four sides are square. They'd make okay. these two gigantic round rocks with square holes, stick it into the holes, and turn it into a giant axle. And now you just have to roll around this axle. Then you take the wheels off, 
and you had this obelisk anywhere you wanted it, and then all you had to do is dig a hole. You would build up the sand, dig a hole, and put it in place, and you were good to go. It, they, they proved that was impossible to move with just rolling wood was perfectly possible to do if you just turned it into a giant car axle. Yeah. Hey, it was just my, my point was, though, that they found a creative way to fix it. Yeah. That no, human yeah. beings could do it. The human beings were capable of moving the fucking rock. It was yeah. a rock. It's a rock. You can, you're you're, you're telling time. me they could carve it out of, uh, 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 carve this rock with, with tools, but they couldn't move it. Yeah. yeah it used to drive yeah. me nuts. That would be the only thing, because I used to love the cool things you'd see in the Inca Mountains. you see these rocks that look like they were like molded into position. And I'm like, mm, that's so yeah. cool that they did this like 5,000 years ago. And then you no, got I'm... the Egyptians that are moving these huge granite stones 400 miles, and they weigh like 25, 30 tons each. And then they lifted them 500 feet in the air. It's like this insane thing. And you're like, why are you ruining this story? I, you can give me any other story. Some guys are saying they used a bunch of really big kites to move it. And there's all these little uh, nuanced ideas that, that are fun to play with. But telling me you can't do it, I just say it, it drives me bonkers. Drives me absolutely bonkers. Yeah, saying that it's completely impossible. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. And, and not only that, but you're not even taking the consideration. You weren't there when they did it. You weren't yeah. there. You weren't there. Okay, so a great a great example of that is they, they said Roman concrete is the best concrete. And we tried to recreate it because we crushed it up and we did a, di a dialysis. We dissected it and did a whole analysis and all the chemicals. We recreated all the chemicals. We made the concrete and our concrete sucked. And then they said, oh, they used uh, volcanic ash. So they put volcanic ash, and they said it still sucks. And they said, why the heck is their stuff still standing? I mean, that dome is all concrete. There's a gigantic dome that's nothing but concrete. That thing is 800 years old. It's still there. It's the, it's the largest free-floating concrete dome on the planet to this day. And they're like, Wait, how? Wait, where is it at again? Uh, that, that's in Rome somewhere. I forgot what it's called. It's the one where the front has the gable. But the gable looks like it's off because there was like a little trim piece that's like 30 feet oh, higher. Oh. But there's a giant dome in the main, main section of the building. So that dome's concrete. And they're like, why can't we create this concrete? Well, they found out that if you heated up the concrete while you were making it, like boiled it basically, there was a yeah. chemical reaction with the lime that made it porous. So every time it rained, the lime would expand and the concrete would get stronger. Wait, what? But it took them like a... It took them like a 30 years to figure that out. So you don't know what they were doing until you actually were there when they were doing it. Do you know how many little things like boiling your concrete before you, you pour it, boiling it while you're mixing it, how much that changes the chemical compounds and all those materials? And no one would have known that until they stumbled upon it like 30 years later. And it's just how many things did they do back in the day that we just didn't realize the little extra that they did, that we just can't see with the naked eye just observing. Nah, dude, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. So there's Crazy. so many more things. There's so many more. And we haven't even scratched the surface. You got all these things. I just There's so much out there that people just don't realize. Yeah, to, to, to be so arrogant as to say that, like, I completely know for sure that this is just no. Like, there's a level of arrogance to it that it's like, just like the point you made. It's like you weren't there, so... How do you really know without a shadow of doubt for sure? Because you weren't there. And that's a solid point. And especially with the concrete boiling thing, that's something I completely was not even like in my thought process. But that completely changes like the way... It makes me think about it differently, if that makes any sense. And it doesn't have to be complicated. These guys didn't have cell phones to bother them. They didn't have a bunch of things to distract them. They weren't constantly capable of getting whatever they wanted all the time. So they had time to be patient and they had time to think things through. Have you ever been in a zone where you could really, really concentrate and you're like, I'm going to fix this. Come higher hell water. This is going to work. I'm going to yeah. make this work. And you get in the zone, right? You get in the zone. Can you imagine if you were like that every day? And if, yeah. Can you imagine if hundreds of guys, not not five or seven or eight, but a hundred of guys were dedicated to being in that zone six days a week? 
Where would you go with that? You can go anywhere you want, man. You could stack yeah. rocks as high as you want. There's not much that you couldn't do. Uh, uh, the Bible said that they, that God said that they could do whatever they wanted to the point where he had to stop them because they were out of control. And that's another – yeah, that's crazy that you think about it because really if we – that's one of the craziest Bible verses I think I've ever come across. Like the fact that if all of us united together under one like body, there's nothing we couldn't do. Like that's insane. Like that, that really means that we really could do anything if all of us were united. <laughs> I, um, so we were talking about everybody getting together and, and, and being one mind, being uh, really putting their effort into one purpose. And um, if you think about it, it doesn't even take that many guys so if you look at the Wright brothers, right, they said, I want to fly like the birds. And everybody laughed at them. They were making bikes and everybody laughed at them. You ain't going to fly. They said, I want to fly. They made their thoughts. They could see an airplane in their minds. They made what was in their mind a thought or reality. Mm. We can literally, and I think that's one of the reasons why our words are so important. Because our thoughts, our words, they matter. They have, they, 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 they can be, we, yeah. It said, what, God spoke the universe into existence? And maybe yeah, we yeah. are a little bit like God. So if you think about it, a rocket ship, someone thought it up in their mind. It wasn't like they went to Mars and went to the, the rocket store in Mars and bought a rocket. There was no rocket. Someone thought of a rocket, and then they built a rocket with their mind. Yeah. because There started... was no reverse engineering this. The, the, the rocket didn't exist. Someone said, I'm going to make one anyways. And then it did exist. And then every time there was a problem, they fixed the problem by inventing new things that compensated, whether it be a gyro or whatever it be. And they kept on playing little games until they invented a thousand things to make that one oh, thought reality. You cut out. Sorry about that. No, no, no big deal, man. That's happened to me several times with a couple guys. Uh, that's the price we pay for not being next to each other, man. But think <laughs> about this. Think about this. How convenient is it that we could be talking? I've talked to a guy from France a couple months ago, a guy from Australia. It's actually really cool that we have this convenience, you know? Yeah, because we don't even have to, because normally, like, we'd have to be right next to each other. Not only that, we'd have to plan uh, even more time out of our day because you'd have to get set up. I'd have to get ready, go over there, then yeah. drive back. And with this was just get on the call, do it for the time we need to, and then bada boom, bada bing, it's done. Yeah, it, it takes 20 minutes out of my day extra than the actual whole thing. And same thing with you probably, if, if that. Especially once it's scheduled. I don't think it takes that much once it's been scheduled. No. Um, let's get jump back in, man. I'll edit out this to make us look as good as possible. So what do you think, man? What do you think when we want to make something happen? How does it look? I, I honestly, I can't really disagree with that because, well, to an extent, I think, uh, basically, I think that genuinely, yes, every... Uh, anything that was created first originated from a thought and uh, the power that your thoughts have and the power that your words have truly, uh, we can't really uh, measure it. If that makes any sense, it's kind of, it's insane what people can truly do when they genuinely put their minds to something. Uh, now saying that you can't take that and use that for everything. Like I can't say I'm going to fly uh, tomorrow with like i'm gonna wake up tomorrow with superpowers you know what i mean like we can't say we can't take it to the extreme and say that we can do that with everything but i do believe if you genuinely if you're willing to, you can have what you want if you really want it yes there has to be action and sacrifice involved yes if you like to give an example like if you want to have a successful company right you're going to have to sacrifice a majority of your time for that to work. You know what I mean? And by sacrificing that time, that sacrifices other things in your life, your social life, your friendships. Uh, if you have a wife, if you have kids, you're going to sacrifice that time because you want the business to be successful. So you can truly have anything that you really put your mind to, but you have to really want it. I agree. Is what I would say with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll be honest with you, the best way to enjoy life to the fullest is to not overcompensate one for another and try to keep a balance on four or five fronts. Family, friends, pleasure, and work all have to be relatively balanced because what if one of them fails? 
What if your business fails? You're going to want to lean on your family. What if something in your family fails? You're going to want to lean on your business. You're going to want to lean on your friends and your pleasure. And you're going to want to have those hobbies. And uh, I go to Kinko's Islands every year. Whatever it be that you do, you're going to want all those things in place. You need to have, uh, yeah, you need to have foundational pieces within your life. And it's, it's like having a, you don't, it's, it's like, think about it as like a hard drive. You don't want to store everything on one hard drive because what if you lose it? Then you, you lost, lost it. everything. Yeah, yeah, everything's in oh, one God. basket. So, yeah, no, I would, yeah, I, I can't say I just agree with that, man. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. All right, so on that note, man, I've got a list of cool stuff to talk about, but I don't want to go crazy on anything. I want to stay on to some of the stuff. What is uh, one of your favorite conspiracies you like to uh, BS about? Okay. Um, I really like the I, – I love to talk about secret cults. Uh, I'm very interested in them. They they fascinate me. Uh, just because of how secretive they are and how successful they are with those secrets, how – uh, it's very intelligent how they stay. Uh, basically, they're out in the open, but you don't. People don't even realize it. And I think it's kind of crazy how the psychology works behind that. Uh, other kind of conspiracies I love to talk about is I do love the moon one. I love to talk to people about that. I know that's kind of overplayed, but I do love to talk about that. I really love to get into the World Economic Forum, the New World Order. Uh, I think that that's just genuinely important to talk about. And I think that that is more than just a conspiracy. I think it's a genuine issue. Uh, But yeah, pretty much World Economic Forum, the New World Order, uh, secret cults. That's kind of my... Very cool. And uh, when it comes with the New World Order and uh, and, uh, the forum there, uh, it's a shame because so many of those guys are trying to do some good things. Uh, one of the things they wanted to do there, Bill Gates was a part of it too, was uh, end world hunger. And they mm-hmm. were supposed to do it by 2030. Yeah. And I think they already accomplished it by like 2018. Yeah. You know, and, and China, Russia, America, and a couple of India and a couple other places, basically you either got a corn mesh or a rice mush or whatever it was, and it, and it made it around the world every mm-hmm. day so that no one had to have those swollen stomachs with flies in your eyeballs and it would just well then then COVID hit and now yeah. it's oh that's out the window oh that's out the window <laughs> and, and it's a shame because um not just like the luxury beliefs that the poor suffer the most but whenever yeah. we pull back any of these these good agendas the, these good opportunities they were popping holes for water everywhere 10 years ago everywhere no one was going to have to walk two miles for muddy water to boil it was going to be coming out of a, a small well in every little community in Africa and India. And out. They, they, they had this down to a science, man. This was, this was going to be fixed. And not only that, I don't know if you know this, but um, they were saying by, what was it, the last census they did, I think it was 2020, um, the average human being was doubling its productivity every 17 years. So if you were in Africa and you were making $3 a year, every 17 years it was doubling. So they actually had... The whole world was getting better. Well, the, the point was, like, um, if you had a mine and you had a bunch of kids working the mine, and that guy got rich that owned the mine, he eventually wanted a butler and someone to fix his car and someone to go to a restaurant and, and serve him food, and all of a sudden it trickled down to 20 people needing to be, like, a lower middle class. Oh, okay. And then that lower middle class needed people to do stuff for them. So someone had to make their shoes. Someone had to make a hat. And even if you imported it, someone had to be the guy that was the merchant that imported it. So every time something grew in Africa, it exponentially grew with everybody else. Now, granted, the kids were kind of like slaves, but eventually the guy's like, man, I can get more productive teenagers or more productive 20-year-old males to do twice as much in 10-hour days. And before yeah. you know it, it exponentially got better. No matter where it went, those those copper mines, those gold mines, those silver mines, whatever it be, eventually became something more than just that, that, that hashtag group of little kids. And the same thing with China. And actually, I think they were saying on, tw- on the year 2020, um, they were quadrupling every 17 years. I think it was something to that effect. 
Um, so you take that 30, 40 years, take that 100 years. Where, where does the world look where we're feeding everybody properly so they can get a, a, at least a mild education and everybody's being more productive? That would be beneficial to everybody. Everybody. There's not, there's not one. And all of a sudden, eggs are $5 a carton, $8 a carton. How the heck did I don't understand how that happens. It blows my mind. Uh, it frustrates me out of for no end. Um, because we were living in, in a time of abundance. In, 2000, in 2020, we were watching cars become lower in price, TVs, food. I was paying 75 cents a carton of eggs. I think milk was what, like $1.25, $1.15, something no. like that. So um, uh, th that's another thing that I would like to, to, to catch on with what, what the World Forum is trying to do. Because it seems to me like... They were afraid of stagnation and everything deflating. And here's why I say that. The first time the plasma TV or the LCD TV came out, how much was it for a TV, a 32-inch TV? When it first came out? First came out. Oh, I don't even know. I think they were like eight grand. I think so. Yeah, six, six or eight grand. Because like three or, four years late, three or four years later, they were like four grand. Cause I remember going to a pawn shop and buying one for a thousand. I thought it was a great, I thought it was the greatest thing. I got a Sony Pravada. It was like four <laughs> inches thick. It was like four or five <laughs> inches thick. And I was like, man, I'm the first one in my neighborhood to get one of these things. Uh... And, uh, but uh, how much can you get a TV now? They weigh like three, like... three pounds and they cost about a hundred bucks. hundred to, yeah, a hundred to 300 uh, for the regular flat now, screen. My, my question to you is, if those factories kept pumping out those TVs, how much would they be worth in 20 years? In 20 years, probably half that. Nothing. No, no. It would get to the point where I got five TVs in my house. If you've got five TVs in your house and my neighbor's got five TVs, I got five TVs. I have a tag sale or a yard sale. And I'd be giving away TVs. That's, dude. You say, oh, my TV broke up. Ah, don't worry. I got an extra one. You can just have it. When's the last time you've seen someone kill someone for a Jordan? Yeah. When's the last time you saw someone break into a car to steal their stereo? Been a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, because we have an abundance. I think they were having this problem in the World Forum where they were afraid that we were going to have uh, deflationary issues with everything because we're just being too productive. These factories have been making cars for 100 years. I don't know if you know this. In 2018... Chevy was making a deal with China where they were going to make a brand new car. I think it was a three or four cylinder car. And China was supposed to be able to sell it for a profit at $5,000. Really? Yes. When was this again? Uh, I think it was 2018. She Chevy was starting to work with them. And they, they actually, I think the car company was going to be called Cherry. I think Cherry. it was going to be called Cherry. I don't know why they picked that name. But yeah. the bottom line was... Now, if you could pull a profit the first day that that, that factory opens, mm. how much would that how how much would you have to pay for that car in ten years? The labor costs would go down. The overhead for the building would go down. Your your supply chain for the material in in, in Africa would go down, and that five thousand dollar car would be three thousand yeah. dollars. And the whole narrative that we need to stop with all these cars and combustible engines are evil and gasoline is bad would have been thrown out the window. Who would buy a $40,000 EV when you could buy a $3,000 gas powered car that's guaranteed to work for 10 years? Well, my thing, the reason why I always thought that they really wanted to get into, because first of all, that's a great point that you're making. I never thought about that, but I always thought the reason why they were getting more into the technical they call it like a, a internet of as what's the specific name, uh, smart home devices. Okay. So I thought that the reason why they're getting into more uh, smart home devices, electronic cars, is just the fact that you can control them. Like well, you can turn off somebody's car, you can turn off somebody's thermostat. We already see that in Europe. Yeah. It's just more easily like with a gas powered car, you can't just turn their car off. Oh, absolutely! You yes, you can. Yes, you can. Well, you can, but you have to physically... Low jack, it. man, low jack. The cop just has to tell him, turn that car off, and that's a combustible engine. Cool. You can turn that combustible engine off in a, a heartbeat. 
Well, think about it though. You have to have a cop actually go out to that car and do that. If it's a electronic car, you can do that from your home. You could just turn it off with a button. Yeah. It's a lot. Well, yeah, easier. you could do you could do that with a combustible engine. All you got to do is you got to get the OnStar with Wi-Fi connected to the to the cell phones. Yeah, but what about the cars that were made before the OnStar? You can't do it with those. You just make it an emissions necessity from the state saying that you have to have this this computer component, just like you have to have your lights working and just well, like you have to. Yeah. But think about why they want that computer component, in, computer component in it. And because it's easy to control the car because if you don't have the car, it in the car. You don't I agree. Think- but my point is you don't have to have an EV car to do that. But here's the deal. You're right, yeah. W- yeah. The reason why they want the EV cars is because it's scarce. You can't make 300 million car batteries. Hmm. Now, all of a sudden, the TV goes from $100 to $5,000 again. Not because overhead's expensive. Not because the factories are hard to to pump out the car. It's not because the technology is so overwhelming that they can't make it more than once. It's because now all the elements for the battery are very, very scarce. So now you have to buy an EV car, but we can only make $300,000 a year, or we can only make a million of them a year. And you need 350 million of them just to have one per household now. If you can make them scarce, they become more valuable. And now I can control where you go, and I don't even have to turn your car off because you can't afford a car. Yeah. You got an Uber everywhere. You got an Uber everywhere because those batteries are too scarce for you to own a car that works properly. So now you got an Uber everywhere you go because. I said you have to have an electric vehicle. Yeah. They can only they can only rip out so much uh, cobalt and so much copper per year. There's only so many batteries to go around. I think right now, and that's not even with the rest of the world trying to get to where we are. America is already close to tapped out. Elon Musk made what four hundred thousand this year. I think Ford was next in line with like seventeen or 20,000. You won't be able to keep... We're talking, there's got to be... Okay, there's like 350 million people and there's probably like two and a half cars per person, right? Yeah. Where are you going to get 600 million cars if you could only make 300,000 or 400,000 a year? We'd all be just... You're going to Uber because only the corporations will be able to afford it. Yeah. Maybe that's what the real plan is. Well, have you also seen those uh, super cities too? Oh yeah, yeah, the one in uh, what is it in uh, Saudi Arabia? No, no, it's not. It's uh, uh, Catan or whatever. What what is that no, country? It was in Saudi Arabia. The line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wild. But here's the deal, man. They they got. It's the future. I don't know if it's the future. What I what I do know is they got a problem in the Saudi Arabia right now. They got too many princes. And too much money, and they're they're at that point where they could just eat cake and reproduce, <laughs> and it's yeah. not working out for them real well. I think that's why a lot of them got forced to go to Europe. Why do you think it's not working out for them? Do you think they're well? If you got you got a hundred million guys that don't have any purpose, you're gonna have a problem eventually. They don't have to work. Everybody gets paid from the oil. What's the point? You know, what's the point? So now you got all these restless yeah. dudes. You got all these restless dudes that don't have anything to aim at. You're going to go to church yeah. all day? How many okay. hours are you going to go to church before you get bored of church? Yeah. A mosque, whatever version of that you want to call. But how many times a day are you going to go before you get bored of doing it? You're going to go on a pilgrimage <laughs> forever? <laughs> Everybody's then- got a credit card, and everybody's credit card gets filled at the first because they got oil coming out of their ears. So everybody's mass producing kids and bored out of their mind and it's becoming a problem for them. And they're like, shit, we're going to have to get rid of these, some of these poor people because we just can't have them over here just making babies all day. This is not a rabbit factory. And they sent them to Europe. They literally just sent them to Europe. Dude. <laughs> well, think about this. Thanks. Okay. Now here's another thing that's going to blow your mind. People don't realize this. We've got this huge, humongous problem right now. Europe isn't making any babies. America isn't making any babies. 
Canada isn't making any babies. And China said that each two people has to turn into one person. So if you got 100 million people in 40 years, you're going to be down to 50 million people. You're going to cut the population in half. If every two people makes... You're still there. Okay. If every two people only turns into one person, the next generation's half the size. Yeah. So we're actually going to see this humongous pyramid where everybody's old and all the young people that are supposed to be at the bottom, it, there's nobody at the bottom to hold up the pyramid. I heard that uh, when it comes to trade, uh, at least in America, out of three three tradesmen that retire, only one is replacing them. Well, I, I think the robots are going to kind of compensate for some of those issues. Well, I mean, but that's just to say that there's not, it was just to reinforce your point that we're not, at least over here in the Western world, we're not reproducing. Well, here's the deal. If the population is going to peak, and it looks like it's going to be about 10 billion, maybe 11 billion, because China already changed their policy, they're seeing it as a utter devastation. Yes, you they... can't have everybody 65 and older and have a functioning society. No, because they can't. Yeah, no. It's not functional. So they, not... they've got this huge dilemma, humongous dilemma. And there's other issues besides that growing pains and um, coddled kids because when you only have one child, you could hyper-focus on that one child. Oh, yeah, and single... So you got an entire civilization where a whole generation has been coddled. So they, yeah. that, that's a whole issue all by itself. The growing pains of, of, they got to us. It took us 300 years to get where we are. They did it in 30. The highway system, they didn't invent the highway system. They just mimicked what we did. They didn't invent the skyscrapers. They just mimic what we did. So instead of us evolving into what we got and building upon layer and layer of thought and layer and layer of invention and layer and layer of um, trial and error, they just skipped it all and just grew. So they got growing pains. They got coddled kids and a pyramid system that's all messed up. They've already changed the policy. I think you can have three kids now. Yeah. I think it's three. And there's a good reason why they did that. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's going to work out for them. It, 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 it's really tough to say because it's going to be really, really hard to see how that plays out. But um, worldwide, we're watching at a population peak at about 10 billion, and it's going to be a drastic drop, really, really fast. The baby boomers are going to go. Europe's got the same problem. Um, constant war in Africa. Uh, what just, do you think happens when when that happens? Well, you're going to have another problem with. Everybody's got five TVs and there's so many houses and there's half the people. So now there's 10 TVs per person and three houses per person and 10 cars per person. And they're like, shit, what are we going to do? We want to have control of these people. We can't have them living in abundance. Um, I see what you're saying. Literally, we're seeing it that, 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 that the only explanation for so many dumb ideas. There's so many, so you're, you're telling me the smartest people on earth, the most ambitious people on earth, and all the lawyers got together and made a bunch of mistakes? No, I never thought it was mistakes. I thought that there was always... I, I, th I think they were trying to compensate for um, a deflationary situation where there's too much stuff. We're too efficient, and there's too much stuff. And what happens when there's an unlimited supply of Nikes? No one wants Nikes anymore. No if wants. all of us were driving Lamborghinis, rich people wouldn't want Lamborghinis. Yeah, no, yeah. Scarcity brings uh, value. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that there, there's an element of all that involved in what they're trying to, because again, they're constantly trying to perfect it. And, you can't, and it wasn't designed to be perfected. Human existence was not meant to be perfected. No. Actually... You never get a hero if there's no dragon to kill. Yeah. We're meant to go on an adventure. We were designed to go on an adventure. Now, granted, there's not no India that, that, that Alexander the Great can go find that no one's ever been to before. We don't have that adventure per se, but starting your own business is an adventure. Getting married is an adventure. Um, going on a... Walking the Appalachian Trail. Just that blue, that blue trail from yeah. Maine to Florida. That's an adventure. It would take you like two months. Yeah. 
Ah, or uh, I think you could sail to Hawaii from California. I think they do it every year. That'd be, yeah, no. And, and there's not that many rules either. I think your boat has to be 40 feet long, and I think you have to have like five guys on it or something like that. Outside of that, you could just <laughs> race your way to, to what is it, Oahu, Oahu, whatever it is. But there's constant adventures out there. I mean, there was a girl that got lost in the Indian Ocean not that long ago. Yeah, I didn't hear about that, actually. Uh, well, I think it was like seven yeah. years ago. But it, but the point was, th there's plenty of adventure out there if you're looking for it. Yeah. No, I definitely agree with you. And we were I think we were designed for that. So the, this whole promise that we're going to make everything perfect flies in the face of who we are as an existing uh, sentient being. We were designed for adventure. Uh, if you look at the Abraham story in the Bible... The dude's in his dad's tent playing video games, basically, right? He's just sitting in his dad's house, doesn't want to leave. I think he's like 75 years old. God's like, you got to go on an adventure. We got to go. We're tired of this. Uh, yeah, you, you were meant to do something with your life. You weren't meant to just sit in your dad's house and play video games. So he literally has to go on this adventure at way later. And it's a, it's a constant up and down struggle. But we see a story of someone struggling, and we can identify with that. We can relate to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we were designed to see someone else's story. We were supposed to we were supposed to slay the dragon. We were supposed to go out and do something. We're, we have so much more potential than we than we realize, and I think we have a lot more capacity to invent than we realize. I think there's so much more out there. I think the cell phone was just the beginning. I think AI is just the beginning. I think the robots and the self driving cars. I think they're just scratching the surface. Of what potentials out there? There's so much out there. Yeah, because we, I mean, we're only finite, so, and the universe is infinite, so there's really, who knows what's out there, man? Like truly, I, everything that's out there. Yeah. We don't even know if we know all the elements yet. Yeah, no. We don't even know. We don't even know. We think we know, but we don't know. And then no. all of a sudden, a rock comes from outside of our solar system, and we have no idea where it came from. Who's to say it had the same elements we have? We have no idea what was on that rock. No, there's that. Uh, that's one of the most scariest, but also one of the coolest things I think about being a human is the fact that you'll never truly know everything. So that's scary because there's always going to be the unknown, but it's also cool because the unknown is where, like you say, the adventure is at. And that means there's always going to be something to learn. Always. You'll never truly be bored. And if you're not bored, if you're not bored and you're in the zone and you're on your adventure, you're going to have to invent something to get through all of your struggles. You'll have to invent something. You Have you ever tried to work on your car and you had to, you had to figure something out? You had to, yeah, you had to jerry. Jerry. Yeah, man, or fix the chair you're sitting on. You had to figure something out that you've never done before. And sometimes you actually have to invent something on the spot. Yeah. I think we were meant to do that kind of stuff, man. No, I agree. I think we definitely... And, and speaking about that, I think in a, in a weird way, I think technology, or at least like the cell phones, social media, I think it makes people believe that they can't do those things. Mm. Uh, whereas I think beforehand... Uh, like, I'll get... Let me try to phrase it like this. My uh, mother, when she grew up, she didn't have like phone, Google or anything like that. Right. And so when she had to figure something out, she had to ask somebody. She had to well, really kind of rely on another human being who knew like what it was. Now, whenever I would run into a problem when I was younger, I never used Google or I never used my phone, even though I knew how to use them. I would never use them to like look up how to do anything. I would rely on somebody else. And she would always be baffled. She'd be like, David, you have a device in your hand that literally teaches you how to do anything. Why do you ask me how to do things when, you're, when your device can teach you how to do anything? And I think a lot of people who grew up with phones kind of have that same mindset where when you have something that can do everything for you, in a weird way, like we don't use it in its truest capabilities, if I'm making any sense. We, um, 
we uh what's the word we undervalue our potential or what we're able to do i guess it's scary because i think you guys have the the golden opportunity i'm gonna get older and i'm not gonna be able to do things like i used to and you guys are gonna have 40 years to play with all this stuff there's so much stuff there's so much stuff and if we do this right there'll be robots walking around and cars that drive things everywhere and who knows, maybe rocket ships to the moon on vacation for the weekend. I, I have no idea. Maybe it'll be like Total Recall. I have no idea exactly how it's going to play out. But it looks like if we don't have too many big wars that stop everything, everything's going to double every 18 months until we get to the point. And it seems like our pro- productivity is going to, to increase every year. Um, people are going to get higher, more educated. And what you don't realize is, how many Einsteins can we produce when there's 10 billion people all eating correctly and going to school? A lot. Uh, maybe one or two a generation. Instead of waiting 300 years for one Einstein, maybe we can get two every 40 years. 10 billion people is a lot of freaking people, man. Yeah, that's a lot to sift through. And, and not only that, but not every Einstein is Einstein. Sometimes Einstein is Elon Musk. Yeah, they're different. You don't, you know, you don't know which which kind of, of genius you're gonna get, and you don't know where it could sprout out in India. It could sprout out in Africa. We have no idea where they're gonna come from. But normally, okay, there's a Pareto distribution where um, you'll have someone that makes really good music, right? Yeah. And they'll be like one hit wonders, and they'll be yeah. how many thousands of people make a song and they never get anywhere. But then there'll be a bunch of guys that make one hit wonders, and then there'll be one band, one band will make 16 records and each record has like eight number one hits. Yeah. Or you have like someone like Taylor Swift where 10 years she makes like a thousand oh. songs. No one writes these songs. She writes those fucking songs. And she, like half of them are number one hits. And and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a math formula where I think 80% of all the, 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 the work is done by 20% of the people. Yeah. And, and you can't even change this. You can't. So the best electricians, there'll be a hundred electricians. Twenty of them will own companies and be really, really, really good at electri- being an electrician. And uh, the same thing with music. Same thing with art. And same thing with writing books. There'll be thousands of guys that write one book. Then there'll be one dude like Stephen King who writes two hundred number one bestsellers. Yeah. And how many of those guys are we going to get? I don't know what they're going to be, what they're going to do, if they're going to be Elon Musk or Albert Einstein or or, or writing novels. I, I don't know what, but how many will we get without 10 billion people? Yeah, no, you're right. I, I, I can't imagine. And they're going to have, they're going to have the tools. We're not talking about moving rocks anymore. We're talking about you can do anything. You guys have everything at your hands. And you got 300 years of infrastructure backing you up. You don't have to go build a road to go move that rock. There's already a road there. That road has been there for 100 years. So all the hard work has already been laid out, and there's unlimited potential. There is unlimited potential, but there's also a lot of things that are getting in the way of that unlimited potential, too. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't look at the future and see it as, uh, as grandiose as that. I see the future as a lot more, uh, dystopic though, to be honest. Do you think we'll degenerate to like a 1984 kind of scenario? hundred percent. Big, big, big brothers is going to focus on everything. Well, I think that's, I think it's only, that's going to happen just because I think that's inherently kind of what we want. I mean, from my experience, people will trade. Uh, people will trade their freedom for security. Mm. People don't really care about like. And one thing COVID taught me is people don't really care about their rights. They don't care about their freedoms. Really, they care about security and comfort. Two things people care about the most is security and comfort. And if you can manipulate people and if you can lie to people and convince them that if they do these things for you that you will give them security and comfort you can get them to do anything you want and we saw that with covid they literally shut down the entire world 
for like two years because they told everybody there was a virus in the air that was going to kill them all. And we all believe, not all of us, but majority of us just lost our businesses, lost everything over yeah. a, a lie. So because of that, it's it's hard for me to look at the future and think that because I think the majority of us just would take the... Uh, the path of least resistance. Yeah, if that makes any sense. But I mean, I, I, w I, I hope I'm genuinely wrong, though. I do hope that the future is what you say. And I do agree that 100% that that's a possibility. But it just seems like the other dystopic reality, it seems like that's where we're going. Hmm. Well, it is true that both are, are possibilities and they're both options. Absolutely. It's, it's going to be it's going to be up to us to decide which <laughs> one we choose. And that's kind of the cool thing about it, too, because it really is at the end of the day, we're we're left with two options. We can go the route of what you said and we can go the route of what I said. And it really depends on us as people individually. What choices are you going to make? You know, obviously not all of us are in positions of power to change like major things, but really all everybody's decisions genuinely matter. You don't realize the effect that you have or the effect that your decisions have or just the way that you carry yourself has on other people and how they carry themselves. So yeah. you're if we genuinely if all of us genuinely understand the fact that our actions if we can truly understand the weight of our actions, I feel like we would have the the bright future that you say. But if we ignore the true consequence of our actions, I feel like we go the other way. Well, here's the deal. I think it's like a circle, man. I think uh, soft times make weak men and that whole like story that you hear. Oh, where dude, we just keep going. Good. Yeah, man. It's a very <laughs> reciprocal reality. So here's the deal, right? My grandfather was tough as nails. My dad was pretty tough. I'm not as tough. You're, and we haven't had a depression or a big war in how long? Yeah. When's the last time a bunch of guys had to either go sit in a, a soup kitchen line and wait for bread and soup or go to a war on another continent? It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a minute. I, nah, man, I, I don't, I've never suffered in my life. I'm 44 years old. I have never suffered. Yeah. Not, not like my grandfather did. Yeah, no, dude. No, 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 no man. <laughs> uh, so I'll be honest with you. I think we're at that weak moment, but it, it only goes so far. And then the pendulum swings and then it goes all back. Just like you said, uh, it's not linear. It's more reciprocal. It seems like a, just a redundant game we play as if yeah. we were designed for a certain adventure. And if we don't fulfill it, it has to go in a full circle and start over again. Yeah, I think that eventually, I think the, uh, how do I explain this? Okay, so this is coming from a, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to go about this at, at, in a Christian perspective, but I think that uh, essentially what happens is eventually, I think societies, well, throughout history, I think that there's always a, uh, a Rome type uh civilization or like a babylon or america there is a empire that pretty much has its influence throughout the entire world and they kind of dictate how everything goes essentially right and i think that eventually how the people of that empire act dictates basically what happens everywhere else mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is i think that if like throughout the Bible, whenever these empires, whenever they were uh, completely uh, just drenched in sin, eventually God would come in and he would wipe them out. And the reason he would do that is because the cries of their uh, like his, it, the cries of the other cities and nations that were being affected by these empires would come up to God and eventually he would come in and do something. And I think that America I think we're at that point. I think we're at the point where we're genuinely being judged by God. I think that he's given us enough time to change our ways and to reverse our course. And I think that we as a nation collectively haven't. And I think that we're just paying the price that every nation before us has paid for going against God. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just what's happening with us today. 
Um, I, I see no evidence to disagree with you, man. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it seems like uh, we definitely had some chances to repent. And I think we've had chances in the past. People don't realize we've been in other depressions. Um, 1944, or what was it, 42, whatever? I think it was 42. Or no, 39. Wasn't it the tw the late 20s? Early oh, was 30s? it the late 20s? Yeah, then World War II took us out of it. Okay, so 29 was the the, the yeah the beginning of the Depression. So uh, that wasn't the first time that's ever happened. I think that's happened three or four times before. We've had and, three or four Depressions even before that? Oh, yeah, I believe so. And I think um, one of the things that happened while that, those would occur, and they would happen like every 30 or 40 years, is um, guys would get real drunk. There'd be a huge problem with alcoholism as everything would collapse. And uh, that's one of the reasons why the temperance movement even came into being there was they got tired of getting their asses kicked by a bunch of drunk guys. These women didn't want to get beat up by their husbands anymore. Uh, really? <laughs> uh, well, you have to go back and look at your history. Don't, don't, don't take my word for it. But I, I don't believe that there was only one depression. I believe there was other depressions. And I believe that at one point, at one of the depressions in the 1800s, there was more... Um, was it more rum or more brandy per gallon than there was human beings or something like that? It was some outrageous number where they were just making so much alcohol it was out of control. Um, but my point is we've had several chances where you would feel the pinch. My grandfather had to bend nails. He had to feed chicken almost nothing. He had to sacrifice and suffer. And he remembered being that poor. He said, I'll never be that poor again. He made sure he paid cash for his car. But yeah, um, my grandfather suffered a little bit and that was a humbling experience and I think it kept everybody on their toes. You weren't, uh, you weren't someone that was arrogant as the last couple of generations are getting because you did yeah. have to sacrifice a little bit and you had to be tested by fire a little bit. And uh, I think with depressions were the best thing that ever happened to us. I, honestly, dude, I think that uh, my mom gave me a, a saying uh, a couple years ago that always kind of stuck with me and she said uh because she's a christian as well too and she said the best thing that can happen to christians is persecution and when she first said it to me i was like mom that's kind of crazy like <laughs> what do you mean like to have our people get killed for what they believe in like why is that a good thing for them and she goes because david the the reason why it's good for them is because if you think about it there's no other way to get closer to God because if you're getting persecuted for what you believe in, you're truly giving everything up for what you believe in. Like nothing, nothing's more important than that thing. And you're demonstrating that by genuinely willing to lose everything for that thing. Um, but also to go with your point, I think that the harder your life is, the more shit you go through. I believe it's kind of like a refining process it's like the harder your life is the more refining you're going through it creates character it creates uh compassion because you gain understanding through the fire uh it i, I think it's genuinely uh one of the greatest things that can happen to people having a, a difficult life if you go through it with a correct mindset that is because yeah, you can't be corrupted by it. That's key. Yeah. If, yeah. If you can overcome your suffering mentally, it's the greatest thing that can happen to you. Yeah. That's what I would say to that. Absolutely. And, um, it seems like whenever you, uh, you put pressure on something or you, you, uh, you try to suppress something, it gets stronger all by itself. It's like, yeah. there's a natural physical, uh, equilibrium that occurs. No, is it so like, to, uh, cause that kind of reminds me, like, let's say, uh, if I, if I promise I wasn't going to do something and I break that promise, like I shrink a little bit, yeah. uh, it makes me weaker. And it, it's, a, it's not just, it's, and you it's can a feel whole it. body. It's yeah, a you whole can body feel experience. It. Yeah. You feel like you're genuinely shrinking. Cause you're like, you feel less of yourself. And it's it's gained a bit of you. It's taken a part of you, and you've you've given it that uh, permission to do it. So it feels even worse, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. Now you know how you make yourself feel stronger and bigger. 
I want to see what I want to hear your opinion on it. My opinion is every time you keep a promise to yourself, when you have the discipline to do something you said you were going to do and follow through all the way through it, it's the exact opposite of that that other feeling. So say I I, I get up at four o'clock every morning and go to the gym. I tell myself I said I made a promise to myself and I'm lazy and I don't want to and my mind says oh you went yesterday you don't have to go tomorrow and you do it anyways. When you keep that promise to yourself. There's no greater satisfaction because the first person you've ever lied to was yourself. Before you ever lied to somebody else, before you ever made that weakness, it first started with a lie you made to yourself. Yeah. So if you want to unravel all that, you want to unravel that? You want to unravel that. If you truly want to unravel that, start making promises to yourself and fucking keep them. And slowly... New ones that you forgot you did when you were a kid or you forgot you fucked up with your mom or you forgot you stole from the store or whatever it is will slowly reveal itself and you'll be stronger than you were before with every little thing. And it doesn't, it's so small. I could start with this. I promise I'll make my bed every morning. I promise I'll clean my room. I promise I, I, will, I will brush my teeth, take a shower, put my clothes on before I touch my fucking phone. Make these little yeah. promises. Seriously, I do that, that's what I do, okay? Every morning, I do like 10 things before I'm allowed to even touch my phone. Do you know how hyper-efficient I am at those 10 things now? I can do them better than anybody else on the planet. I am fucking the, I am the master of those 10 things. But I made a promise to myself and I kept it. And you, you literally what- become a stronger, bigger, more powerful person that's braver to take on the next thing that comes and the adventure of life becomes, let me find the next thing I need to fix about myself or my room or my car or my kids or my family or my wife or my dad. And all of a sudden they peek, they peek themselves out. As you keep those promises to yourself, they start peeking. Every time they peek, if you address it and look at it square like a man, you will grow a little bit more. You'll become so powerful that you will not have an issue with keeping your word or or um, or telling the truth. Because sometimes I want to lie. I've been I've been on this journey where I don't want to lie anymore for like a year now, and it's fucking yeah. way harder than you think. Because you don't want to yeah. look like an idiot, so you don't want to say that you did this or you didn't do that because you don't want to look yeah. stupid. Yeah. Or or um, that's a big you one. lie because you don't want to get in trouble. Like <laughs> shit. I'm going to get yeah. in trouble if I say I, you know what I mean? And these, those little lies shrink you. And I'm telling you, if you start keeping promises yourself, the ability to tell the truth gets easier. And then they all start snowballing. So if you look at it, the world is in a circle where it's not telling the truth, it's telling a lie. And it goes into a circle. But you could personally go in a circle of being honest and telling the truth and keeping promises to yourself. And you go on a completely different journey. If you're telling the truth all the time, David's taking the journey that David's supposed to take. And if you lie, you're taking some other journey you're not supposed to take that you're not equipped to make. Mm. And you're trying to kill a dragon you weren't meant to kill. Mm. You're not meant to kill my dragon. You're meant to kill David's dragon. And there's one out there for you to find in a cave somewhere that you have to find if you go on the journey correctly. Yeah, dude, I agree with you. Yeah, it's a wild, it's a wild concept, man. Now I'm not gonna lie to you. I still occasionally lie. I still fall short. I still, I still uh, don't keep the promise a hundred percent to myself. But I always get back up and I write in my journal. I say I fucked up. I right, day one. Let's start over again. Because the goal isn't to get be perfect. The goal is to keep going until I am perfect. And if that means I have to wait until I'm ninety years old and I'm dead. Wait, fuck can it, you I'm... say that? Can you say that saying again? The my goal isn't to be perfect, but I'm sorry, that was just a really it really stuck out to me. My goal isn't to be perfect, but but I'm gonna keep trying until I eventually reach that that point where I, I I've gotten I don't know I don't remember what I said I'll have to look at the video, man. Okay. Sorry, it just it really it yeah. was it, it just stuck out to me. That was uh, just an interesting way you put it. Yeah. But yeah, you, you'd be amazed, man. And, and here's the, the kicker. If you are on the proper journey you're supposed to go on, there's people that are going to follow you. Um, how many people did Elon Musk blaze a trail for 
where other people found their purpose because he fulfilled his purpose. Mm. And here's another thing too. You've seen him take bullets because he tells the truth. Do you think he started telling the truth like 18 months ago? He's probably been telling the truth his entire life. So you got a lot of these people, they'll be at work and they'll say, when I become manager, then I'll be more bold. Or when I become the assistant manager, I'll be more truthful. Or I'll oh, be yeah. more assertive. Or I I'll be more... you think you're going to be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're not doing it now, you're you're, it's going to be now. way harder later. It's kind yeah, of like saying, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give 10% to the church when I'm a millionaire. Well, if you can't do it with 40 grand, you're not going to do it with 400 million. You're really not. And that, that's the way we are a, as a whole. And I think it was Jordan Peterson that said this, to be honest with you. He said, it's not a trivial thing to keep your room clean. It's not as trivial as you think. A lot of people aim too high and, and fail and get, um, get discouraged because they're trying to take on more than what, what they, they weren't ready for yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, you're capable, you're capable of way more than you think, but you haven't started low enough yet. You got to humble yourself and start at the bottom and work your way up. We're all supposed to be fools at the beginning. You can't be a yeah. master right away. Yeah, because that would be the point of learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, half the <laughs> journey is learning. Half the journey. Half the journey is learning. If, yeah. if what you were doing was going to be easy and you didn't have to learn... You could have just skipped the whole journey and gone to another journey. No, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much there. And I, it sounds like your mom's a pretty smart person, man. And I really think we're in a place right now where we're going to have like this male revival kind of thing because we're, we're, we're seeing a decline in our civilization where men uh, aren't, yeah. are, are, especially young men aren't really finding their full potential. And I think that, I know this is a, a, I know he's a controversial figure, but uh, I'm bringing him up for a specific point. Uh, how you said uh, a revival in men, I think we're genuinely seeing it because of figures like Andrew Tate. Now, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with uh, everything that he said, but one thing that stuck out to me about him since we're talking about this is he's hyper-focused on uh, basically people like me, young men. Um, and as a young man, I can completely, uh, I can understand the pull uh, for people of my age who are men to somebody like Andrew Tate because for the past, it feels like ever since I was born, it feels like we've been abandoned. It feels like every problem in the world has been thrown at us just for existing. Um, and eventually, you know, we get fed up with that and we get fed up hearing that all the problems are us. So when we hear somebody that finally says something else and finally has our back, there's a pull because there's a belief that, hey, you know, maybe we don't have to be treated like this or looked at this way because there's no reason for it. Um, so I definitely see but I, I I think it's a, it's a scary point, though, because I think that there is going to be a revival in men. But I think that what's going to happen is the revival in men is basically they're going to do the same thing that the feminists have been doing for the past like 10 to 15 years, where basically beforehand uh, they didn't really have rights. And then over the course of. 30, 40 years, they went from having rights to even more than that. So if you just look at the way uh, divorce is set up, it's completely unfair for the man on every level. But essentially, it's gotten to the point where a woman can just say that a man raped him, raped her, and everybody believes it, and he can actually lose his job for that without any evidence. It doesn't work the same way. So I think that eventually what's going to happen is and also with social media and things like that, they get attacked and you this and that. So I think that eventually they're going to group together and they're going to attack all females and look at uh, all females in the negative ways that somebody like Andrew Tate was saying. And I feel like that's where they're getting the fear of the misogynist. And I feel like that's why we're also hearing the misogynist talk with somebody like Andrew Tate is because they do realize that. 
They do sense that, oh, we've treated this group of people so horribly for so long. They're going to do the same thing to us the moment they get the upper hand. Or what do you think about all that? Well, you, you said you fear this and you fear that. And I just want you to know fear is not of God. So number one, yeah, anything no, you, that's motivating you to, uh, to be upset about something. And uh, I would go even further to not even worry. All of it's white noise. Here's the deal, right? It's filler. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Here's the deal. Women say, oh, I want six feet tall, 200 pounds, or six, 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 all that stuff, like six inches, six feet, six figures, all the. Does that yeah. really. <laughs> right now, if say you're 22, my advice to anybody that's 22 years old would be I wouldn't care about any of that. I wouldn't worry about Andrew Tate. I wouldn't worry about Jordan Peterson. I wouldn't want to worry about girls on Tinder. I wouldn't worry about any of that. Because here's the deal. Elon Musk can fuck whoever he wants. Yeah. Why? Because 30 years from now or 20 years from now, if you set your shit straight and you're honest and you get a good job and you invest some money and you put some effort into building your character and buy a house and get a nice car, you will be slamming ass like it's nobody's business 20 years from now. Now, well, granted, no, that's, that's I'm not, not saying that was uh, your goal, but my, my, my point is, though, whatever your goal is, whatever your long-term goal is, I mm. wouldn't worry about anything around you. I wouldn't worry about AI, self-driving cars, whether we landed on the moon, whether Andrew Tate's right, or if we're going to go in a wrong direction. or be, I wouldn't Because basically 99.9% .9 of that can't really be changed currently if you stayed home and pondered it. Uh, yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would, I would, I would focus on tomorrow as yeah. if I want to have as much money in the bank at 35 years old or 40 years old as I can. I want to be as physically fit as I can at 35, 40 years old. I want to be as emotionally stable. I want to be as, uh, as, a f uh, everything you could do to better yourself and the people around you. That should be the goal. Number one. And all the rest of it's white nice. Put the phone down and make some commitments that I'm going to do this before I touch it. Uh, do whatever you can to, to set yourself up for success. Whether that means cleaning your room, whether that means doing a side hustle, whatever it be. And don't worry about all the other stuff because the other stuff is literally going to suck. Okay, do you know why Taylor Swift writes so many number one songs? You know what my theory is? Why? She followed through on what she was supposed to do. And she emptied her cup on that first number one single. And when she emptied the cup, the cup filled up twice as fast. And she followed through on what she was supposed to do. And she emptied the cup again. And it filled up twice as fast. And she did exactly what she was supposed to do. She didn't lie, cheat, or steal. She didn't manipulate anybody. She didn't pander to anybody. She just did what she was supposed to do. And she emptied her cup and it filled up twice as fast. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, I get what you're saying. Okay. So if you if you can aim at a goal and find a way to try to shoot it with an arrow, no matter how many times you miss, now you know I got to stand on this side of the bush and I got to aim a little higher. And maybe after two years, like, shit, I wasn't meant to day trade. You go on to the next task. But you learned a bunch of things while you were trying to do it. I'm weak at this. I'm strong at this. I'm really good at doing this for two hours, but I'm definitely going to have to find someone to help me with this. And then you mm -hmm. go to the next idea and start aiming at that target again. With all the strength and knowledge from the last target. Yeah. Now, you may fail on the first one. You may fail on the second one. You may, I don't know how many it'll take to, to, to hit the target, but eventually you'll hit the target. Yeah. The discipline, the perseverance, the attitude it takes to do that will drive you to get closer to the target until you're hitting the bullseye every single time. Not saying you're supposed to be Elon Musk, but you're supposed to be David and you're supposed to be on a journey and you're supposed to go fight a dragon. And I don't know what that means, but it's way more than you think. It's way more than you think. Did you, did you think that the Wright brothers, when they, when they made that airplane, had any fucking clue what an F-18 was? No. Nah. They had no clue. They had no clue. The F-18 does not exist until they do what they did. 
They were way bigger than they realized. They had no idea how big they were. Or Henry Ford. He had no idea. When he was fighting that car monopoly uh, company that, that oversaw all car companies or whatever. And they said, no, you're not allowed to do it because you don't have enough money or you haven't paid us enough or whatever. He said, fuck it, I'm making cars anyways. <laughs> Two years later, they gave up and he has a transmission company making the floorboards for him for free. <laughs> I mean, he didn't know how big he was until he got where he got. But he was meant to go yeah. on that journey, and he and if he if he didn't try, he would have never hit the target. Wouldn't yeah. And no, some guys, right. some guys are like, uh, what is this, Thomas Edison? Uh, the missed the target twenty thousand times. That's a lot. Do you know what I'm saying? He he didn't know. I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Or or Henry Ford said, "I wanted a V8." Cast it on one solid block. All the engineers, he was the richest man alive, I think, at the time. All his engineers said it's impossible. You'll never be able to cast an eight-cylinder engine in one in one one cast. He said, I want it anyways. And it cost him like three years and an unbelievable amount of money. Dude got what was not supposed to be possible. He got what he wanted. He said, I want it. I don't care. I don't care. He said, I just don't care. Two years deep. Two years deep. Most companies would have went bankrupt. This cat said, I don't care. I believe we're going to be able to make the V8. I want it. Let's do it. And he got what he wanted. That's wild. <laughs> ah, man. It, it, it is wild. I just, I, I truly believe that we have so much more potential than we realize. And if we're on the proper journey telling the truth, the, 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 the ability to get there is, I think, almost unstoppable. And it's three times as big as you think it is. I, yeah, I, 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 I truly believe that. I truly you. believe that. I really can't disagree with you on that. So I can you imagine that. if we had a whole civilization of people with that mindset in the zone as if cell phones didn't exist and actually put their whole heart into something? Uh, I used uh, chat GBT the other day and I asked all kinds of questions on how to make my podcast better. And the, the point was, though, to, to constantly focus on just making it a little bit better. I literally started this like six months ago. With my phone under the mic, just making phone calls to people. Yeah. That's <laughs> crazy, right? It's totally crazy. So I'm hoping in the next couple of months it doubles the capacity. I'm not. I'm definitely not doing very good on YouTube. So I definitely need some uh, some some direction change a little bit. But uh, you know you're doing the right thing when it gets a little bit better. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So, all you can do is all you can do is just tweak it. Every day, just tweak it a little bit. Just find out, okay, what are things that I know that I know I can make better today? Yeah. Or that that's at least the mindset I take with my channel. It's just like, okay, what are some things we can capitalize on? Uh, is it the scripts? Is it the research? Do we need to spend more time on this, this, and that? And it's just like small things. And it's but fun. I, I it's fun. It's it's the it it's that. There's like a purpose and meaning behind it, you know? It's like you wake up every day and you're excited to do it. It's, yes. And if you hit the bullseye, yeah. it's like you emptied the cup. Yes. And if, yeah, you, but, if you play on your phone too much, if you're on your phone too much, it's like it does the opposite. It quenches your spirit and it, it, and it, 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 it kind of like... It does. Puts a cap like, on your when, cup. Whenever... Uh, so, like with my channel, uh, the... After my first three videos, I teamed up with this guy named Rajat, and he's been my editor ever since. And whenever we work on a project together, uh, it, it takes us about a, a full month to uh, the full length videos we do. It takes us about an entire month to uh, get it everything up and running and ready. But after spending that entire and it's like the more I spend time on each project on each video when it's time to release it to where I can show people like the work I did, it's just so satisfying yeah. because it's like, I I think back and I think back to the, the annoying parts of it, the parts where I was like, dude, screw this. Like I'm just, you know what I mean? Like those parts come back to me and it just makes me chuckle and it makes me smile because it's just like, dude, even though it was like that difficult or even though I had to go through all that like bullshit, like look at what, look at look at what we did like look at what we were able to create like this is crazy 
like we went from looking at a blank piece of paper to this and i just think that the whole process of it the journey of it is so worth it yeah it's definitely worth it man <laughs> so I, I don't think there's anything more fulfilling than than being able to define a purpose and fulfill it there, there's no greater feeling man yeah no i did 100 i can't disagree with you on that yeah. it's the reason why we live yes and if you don't have it you don't have a reason to live and if you smoke pot and play video games or play on your phone and give up on your purpose, the world is a lesser place and we have to wait a whole nother generation for someone else to fill that void that you were supposed to fill. Yeah. Wow, that's powerful right there. Yeah. No, I agree, man. It's a, it's a crazy world we live in, man. It really is. It's... In a good way, though. It's oh, yeah, it's thing. worth it, man. It's worth it. <laughs> the, the, the struggle of life is well worth it. Yeah. And uh, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, to be honest with you, man. I really wouldn't. I couldn't. Like, if I could uh, if I could go back and I could choose to not have any of the suffering in my life, I wouldn't do it. Because uh, getting out of the and now i know that we didn't like how you said we didn't suffer through wars or anything like of serious nature but even the things that uh we did suffer uh like to give an example my father passed about two years ago and that was a very difficult thing but getting out of it and going like through that struggle with my family brought us closer like there was good that came out of it so when i look back at all the struggles and things that happened in my life each struggle made me stronger. Each struggle like connected things. It benefited me or benefited those around me at the end of it or at the end of the tunnel. So it's like, I can't, I couldn't replace those because those things were so important and so vital in my life. So I think that people who shoot for the life of just comfort, it's like, you're missing out on so much. You're really missing out on so many things. And it's, you're afraid of the pain, but there's beauty in the pain, if it makes any sense. Absolutely. But you just can't see it until you get out of it. And I think we have a huge curse on us right now. All this stuff that I said was positive has a negative element to it. Yeah. You got instant access to pleasure. You have instant access to entertainment. Um, and it's not good because uh, the dopamine and all that stuff that that, that comes you get with... stuck in it. Yeah. And it yeah, actually exactly. makes and it makes you feel weaker. It doesn't take long yeah. either, man. No, it doesn't, dude. A week of, like, if if you're uh, looking at, I mean, even just looking at a uh, like a pornography site or something like that, like doing something like that, you just feel even just one session, you just feel less yeah. of a man. If that makes any sense, you just oh, feel absolutely. Less of, yeah, I don't, I don't look at it at all anymore. I was I, never, I was never a huge fan. I want to be the star of the show. So yeah. I, but I like the real thing. So I've never yeah. been a huge fan of faking it. Um, now granted there is times when there's nothing else, but I'll be honest with you. I'd rather go without. I, I'd rather. Yeah. It, the, one <laughs> of the great things of going without is now I'm motivated to look her in the eye at the grocery store twice as hard. Cause now my need is way up here and I'm willing mm. to, I'm willing to take way more risk to get that conversation and get that Instagram and get that phone number and get that text message that I would have if I satisfied it myself. Because it, it's, it doesn't mean because eventually, because yeah, eventually I need the, I need the, I need to yeah. release. So one way or another, I'm going to do this. And if I force gotta myself, be the right. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'd rather the real deal anyways, man. And I'll be honest with you back in my day, it was way more fun. You're 21. You go to the bar. No one had a phone. I mean, flip phones. We had flip phones. Okay. So basically, everybody had to interact with each other. Yeah. <laughs> so there would be like you'd see these little migrations of groups of people moving around, and you go outside and have a cigarette, and you can bullshit. I remember there was. I had a girlfriend one time. She was uh, she was a, a karaoke DJ, and mm -hmm. uh, we'd play games. She uh, she'd be like, okay. I'm going to ask for as many quarters as I can. You ask for as many quarters as you can. And we'll see in 20 minutes who gets the most quarters. And we go through this bar. There's like 200 people at this bar. 
And I'd have like four dollars in my pocket, five dollars. This chick would have like twenty bucks. She'd have a cup. <laughs> she wouldn't even have it in her pocket. She'd have this cup full of change. And, oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a fun game, you know. Or we try, and we were dating at the time. We'd see well, who could get the most phone numbers. I get like two numbers. She'd have like ten numbers. But the point was that I had to make ten conversations with complete strangers for like twenty minutes to get those two numbers. Just to get the, <laughs> that's a fun game. I like. Yeah, that. it was a fun game, man. We do dumb <laughs> stuff. I, this girl was a blast. We do dumb shit like that all the time. But it wasn't weird because everybody left their house. Everybody interacted. Everybody looked each other in the face, and it, it was a whole nother world, man. So getting laid was a different game. You you did, you weren't competing with thousands of people that no one really knows, and not only that. But if you had a bad reputation at that bar or one or two of the bars in, in the area, everybody knew. Everybody in the town knew, right? Yeah, well, well, everybody that went around the bars knew. Oh, so you couldn't even... Ah, you'd so, have to go to so, the- you, so there there was a game, there was a cat and mouse game that had to be played where you couldn't be too crazy. Everybody would know. Because then, then everybody would know about you. Yeah. You'd have to go to a different city. <laughs> well, yeah. You weren't you weren't going 400 miles all the time. I'd be over. Yeah, yeah I lived in Connecticut, man. There was there was like three towns you would hang out with, and you knew a lot of. Like I said, I, I my girlfriend was a DJ. She she went around like seven or eight bars. We knew all the people in those seven or eight bars, and sometimes it was the same people. So that's kind of yeah. I wish it was it was still like that, man. That seemed like it was a lot cooler back then. I'm not going to lie. I had a lot of fun, man. I had a lot of fun. But it was a challenge because if you wanted to get laid, you had to earn it. And I'm not saying you had to take her out to dinner and earn it. But I meant if you got her on the phone, that was a big deal. Yeah. And not only that, but if you could get her to go out to dinner and go to like Blockbuster, that was like huge. That was like. Uh, That was Netflix and chill. (laughs) That was Netflix and chill back in the day. And it took a lot to get to that point, man. It, it, It wasn't something you. You just text message for two but that's days. Also, I feel like my generation really kind of misses out on that because like, it's just like a scarcity. Like we talked about, like for my generation, it's so easy to get to that point. But for your generation, you had to jump through some hoops to get to that point. But when you finally got to the point where you can go to the movies with her, like, dude, that was a huge thing. But like for my generation, like, that's just like, that's a normal thing. So when it happens, it's not a big thing. And I feel like that's like my generation. I feel like we're really missing on that. But we take it, we take these things for granted. Whereas your generation, like these were huge things. And I think my generation moves too fast with uh, relationships nowadays. Yeah. I like we'll, they'll, we'll get together and then they're already sleeping with each other. They're sleeping with each other when they don't even know each other. Yeah. Like first day. You know what I mean? It's just it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I try to stay away from the dating sites. I'm not going to lie to you, man. Because uh, <laughs> that shit's wild. I, it's just too much, man. It's too much. I, uh, yeah. So that that's 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 a whole other thing, man. <laughs> All righty. Well, it's getting a little late. Yeah. And David, I appreciate you, man. Um so what's your next project before we leave? Oh, uh, so working on, uh, well, we got two videos. We'll take, we got a couple of projects in production right now uh, that I kind of wanted to mention. The first one is we're finishing up the Freemason uh, series and uh, another project we're working on, which is another series. It's going to be about the Marco Polo report uh done by the nonprofit organization called Marco Polo. Uh it's a nonprofit research organization that has gotten access to Hunter Biden's laptop and his hard drive and they've made a 644 page report. Uh they have text messages, emails, receipts, names of not just FBI but media apparatus, politicians, everybody who had something to do with the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story uh, is all in this report. So our goal is to go through this entire report and create a series about it uh, because I feel like 
it's uh, the story has already gotten suppressed for the past three years because the FBI has had this laptop since 2019. So I think it's about time that we just fully get this story out in a way that people can easily uh, retain the information without having to read 650 pages because I understand people just don't have time to do that. So that's basically our, our next project and the big thing we're working on. That's awesome. Um, I, I, I think we only have like five more minutes, man. So you want to plug your TikTok and Instagram and anything else you got? Oh, yeah. So I have uh, uh, well, I have a YouTube channel. at uh, My YouTube panel is at Illusion Docs. Uh, TikTok is... Uh, illusion productions and we also do have a rumble account uh just in case anything happens to us on youtube and that is illusion also illusion productions good deal so i appreciate it david that was a great conversation this is one of the longest ones i've had dude this was awesome man yeah yeah I, I learned a, i learned a lot from this tonight man so if you're ever open to doing this again, let me know. Absolutely, man. You have a great day. Okay, have a good night. Weather is good. Sun is shining. Sun is shining. Look at my vibe.